why you should trust me. So this is a slide where I get to uh, do a little self-promotion. Uh, I am a board certified plastic surgeon, but after I completed my uh, plastic surgery training, I did an extra year of aesthetic surgery in Manhattan. So what does that mean? Uh, that means that I ran a clinic on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, and I worked with some of the most famous plastic surgeons in the world, literally. And uh, I got to do my own cases. These were all my own patients, but under the tutelage of these uh, very well-respected, well-known plastic surgeons. So it was really a wonderful experience. I did that for a year uh, after I was done with plastics. Uh, so I've been in practice 17 years, and 16 of them we've been doing Botox and fillers. So. I've been basically doing Botox uh, right when it was approved for cosmetic reasons. Uh, the other reason why I think you should trust me is because unlike some plastic surgeons, I do all the injectable procedures myself. Uh, we don't have a nurse that does it. I enjoy doing it. I think it sets up a rapport with the patient and also makes a nice transition for patients that are ready to move on from injectables to something surgical. So I do all the procedures myself. So for those of you that are new to our practice, uh, if you could let us brag in our office a little bit. Uh, we're in the brand new MedStar building um, and our office uh, is brand new and I'd like to think it's pretty nice looking. Uh, Ashley is in the middle there. She's our esthetician. Uh, she does the skincare that I don't do. And if everything you hear so far isn't enough to bring you into the practice, we do have snacks and refreshments in the waiting room. Uh, so, okay, I'm gonna pose a question right off the bat. So all types of doctors do Botox and fillers, right? We know that. So why should you bother to go to a surgeon of any kind, much less a plastic surgeon, if you know you only want to do injectables and not surgery? Well, the answer is because plastic surgeons like myself can tell you everything that can be done uh, to your face. So that way you know what all your options are, and that way you can make an informed decision knowing uh, everything that's available and appropriate. So everything that can be done to the face can be summarized by saying Botox, fillers, skin resurfacing, and surgery. So skin resurfacing are things like derm abrasion, laser skin resurfacing, and chemical peels. Uh, the other big reason is that plastic surgeons are experts in facial anatomy, and I'll point out later a good example as to why it's very important to know uh, the muscles underneath if those are the muscles that you're trying to inject. Obviously, you need to know exactly where they are, and you need to know how to avoid important things in the face like blood vessels and nerves. So this is one of my favorite quotes. This uh, with all due respect, I think uh, describes some doctors that are doing Botox when they're really not qualified. When all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So that means if the only thing that I have in my toolbox is Botox, every wrinkle is gonna get Botox, whether it's appropriate or not. And as I'll point out later, not every wrinkle in the skin would be improved with Botox. In fact, sometimes you could look worse if you in, in, inappropriately inject Botox. So how does a plastic surgeon think about lines? Well. Um, I like to do this algorithm. It kind of points out what my thought process is when you first come to see me. Uh, so first off, I say, if you have wrinkles, I say to myself, hmm, are the wrinkles in an area where there's extra skin? If the answer is yes, then you'd benefit from excising that skin, meaning a facelift or eyelid surgery or a brow lift, some kind of procedure that will remove that skin. So what if you don't? So we're over here now. So if you don't have extra skin, then I say to myself, is the wrinkle caused by muscle? And again, not every wrinkle on the face is. So you have to know which ones are appropriate to treat with Botox. So if the answer is yes, then we're gonna treat you with Botox. Uh, if the answer is no, then I wanna find out uh, how deep is the wrinkle. There's two strategies for lines that are not amenable either to surgery or Botox. And that means the first, the first uh, thought process, process is, uh, should I fill the base of the wrinkle up so it's uh, even with the surrounding skin? If the answer to that is yes, then we inject the base of the wrinkle with some filler. But what if the line is very, very superficial? Now I'm gonna talk later about how some fillers are thicker than others, but there is no filler uh, thin enough to treat every superficial line, especially around the, the fine lines around the mouth, for example. So for this kind of line, we're gonna do the opposite strategy. So that means rather than trying to fill up the line to the surrounding skin level, we're gonna lower the surrounding skin level to the base of the wrinkle. And that's uh, how we do, uh, that's the kind of line that's amenable to some type of skin resurfacing. So Botox, okay, so what is it? Uh, a lot of patients come in and they really don't know what it is. So it's a protein. Uh, yes, it comes from a bacteria. And yes, that bacteria is the same bacteria that causes botulinum, uh, botulism but I'm gonna to talk to you later why that's not a concern. 
Uh, so why is Botox so popular? Well, several reasons. Number one, it's a tiny needle that we use, like a TB needle, for those of you who know what that is. It's a 30 gauge needle, very, very small. Uh, we could do it in the office and you don't require any anesthesia. And there's very minimal post-procedure instructions or restrictions, which we'll talk about later, and there's very little downtime. And it works, it, it, it works uh, very well. So what is it not? Well, it's not a liquid facelift. You may hear some surgeons or other doctors talk about that. Uh, what I like to say is everything plays a role. So surgery plays a role, skin resurfacing, Botox, um, everything plays a role and it's not like these are interchangeable. Occasionally a patient will say, wow, you know, if I spend all this money on fillers, I'm halfway to a facelift. And that, that might be true in some sense if you spend a lot on fillers, but fa a facelift will do things that fillers won't and Botox won't. So everything plays a role. So the concept of a liquid facelift, it's really uh, Botox does not do what a facelift would do. And it's not a permanent fix. So for better or for worse, Botox is temporary. Uh, on average, patients get about three months improvement out of it, but everybody's different, and there are patients that get much longer. Uh, it's not going to make you look weird. Uh, I've been doing this a long time, so I know how to avoid the pitfalls, when, uh, pit, uh, which would make people look odd. And it won't make you look overly frozen, if, uh, and I wrote on the bottom, if you don't want it to, because some patients do want to totally freeze their uh, ability to make expressions. There's no right or wrong answer. But if you don't want to do that, if you want to look better at rest, but not but still be able to maintain your expressions, we could, uh, we could do the Botox so you're in that zone where you're not totally frozen. Uh, so there's three classic areas to use Botox, the forehead lines, the lines in between the eyebrows, which are called the 11 lines, um, and the crow's feet, which are the lines uh, at the corners of your eyes that deepen when you smile. So I should tell you that most of these pictures are not from our patients. Um, uh, the reason is because, uh, to be frank, it's hard to get pictures of patients with Botox because we only see them in between their treatments when it's not working any longer. So it's not common that we take photos of patients when the Botox is working. And also, uh, frankly, a lot of patients, they don't want their face shown to other patients. So you could understand. So most of these photographs are either from the literature or sometimes from Allergan, uh, their website, which is the company that makes Botox. So on the left here, this patient is trying to raise her eyebrows and you can see all the lines in her forehead. And in, in the second picture, in this picture, she is actually trying to raise her eyebrows, but she can't. So this is somebody who chose to, be, uh, to, to have their forehead totally blocked. Not everybody's like that. Some patients would be happy if they could raise their eyebrows, but maybe if the lines were just not so numerous or not so deep. So this patient is, uh, is the, the category of patient that wanted no ability to raise her brows. So similarly, uh, uh, this patient who is frowning, uh, uh, these are the lines that are sometimes called 11s. So same thing in this post-procedure picture, she's trying to frown. You can see she's totally frozen. It's more common that patients want to be totally frozen in between the brows because uh, maybe there are some patients that want to be able to raise their eyebrows, but it's very common that patients are, would be very happy if they could not make the frown lines at all. Uh, so um, that's what's going on in the second picture. So this is a great example as to why you need to know the muscle anatomy because sometimes our patients are surprised that we don't inject uh, right into the 11s. We don't inject right into the lines when we're trying to block this muscle function because the muscle is called the corrugator and it's out here. Uh, which is more lateral over the orbit than the 11s, which are the green lines. So if you're, if you're, if you're an injector, if you go elsewhere and they inject right into the lines, you know that they don't understand the anatomy because the injection should be out here. So crow's feet, again, those are the lines that are at the corners of your eyes that deepen when you smile. So this patient, again, is making the same smile, but you see the lines are gone. So if those are the basic uh, classic places to put Botox, those three, forehead, glabella, and crow's feet, these are sort of the advanced placement of Botox, I like to say. Uh, if you do Botox in the appropriate amount and in the appropriate places, you could actually raise the eyebrows. The bunny lines are the little lines that are in the corner on uh, the sides of your nose that wrinkle when you crinkle up your nose like a bunny. Uh, the lowered eyelid lines uh, are lines underneath your lower eyelid, obviously. Uh, the right amount of Botox in the right spot could actually raise the corners of your mouth if they're downturned. And fine lines of the upper lip are amenable to Botox. Uh, other indications, a dimple chin, a gummy smile, and the masseter muscles, which I will talk about in a second. 
So this is an example of how Botas could raise the brow. I think this is the youngest Kardashian. I think her name is Kylie. So you can see over here, her brow is a little low. Uh, in a female, it's nice for the brow to be over your bony socket. So you could do this at home. If you feel your bony socket and your eyebrow is there or below, you would benefit from doing something to raise your brow. So a little bit of Botox right at the corner of the brow, like literally two units, can help raise the eyebrow like that. So you can see this is much more pleasing. You can see a little bit of her eyelid, which is nice, so you can see the makeup. Uh, so, and what's uh, nice about this is it only takes about two units of Botox to get that effect. Uh, so here are the bunny lines. Um, so this picture, these are bunny lines that happen when you sort of crinkle up your nose. Uh, three injection sites, about two units a piece, and you could get a smooth side of your nose even when you make that expression. I'm gonna use the same picture here for the lines under the eyes. So the muscle that goes all the way around your eye uh, causes the crow's feet, but it could also cause this line right here because what happens is that muscle can, can uh, get a little hypertrophic, which means a little uh, too big and too prominent. So if you were to have a line like that, you might be a candidate for Botox. So if we inject Botox right into that muscle, you can go from that to that when you smile. So the corners of the mouth. So you see this patient has downturned corners of the mouth so it makes her look unhappy. There's a muscle down here called the depressor anguli oris, sometimes called the DAO, which is a triangular muscle right down here. That holds down the corner of your mouth. So if you inject a small amount of Botox right there, the muscle relaxes and the corners of your mouth can go up. So upper lip lines, sometimes called smoker lines. So Again, uh, the muscle that goes around the mouth is analogous to the muscle that goes around your eye. So these lines are sort of analogous to the crow's feet lines. So these are up and down lines that uh, happen to the upper lip. And this woman is pursing her lips like you do when you smoke a cigarette or you uh, sip on a straw, and that accentuates these lines. So a little bit of Botox right where your lip meets the skin of your upper lip, it doesn't take a lot, it can help relax the lines. So you can see she's making the same expression, but the lines are much less obvious. A dimpled chin, not a common request, but if you have a dimpled chin and it does bother you, there's a muscle down here called the mentalis. Uh, when you inject that, uh, you can make that expression, but you won't get as much dimpling. Gummy smile, again, this is an advanced technique. It's not a common complaint, but if you have a smile where you're showing too much teeth and or showing too much gum, if you inject the upper lip right at the base of the nose, the upper lip relaxes and comes back down, so you're not exposing as much of your gums. Masseter muscles, again, not a common complaint, uh, but right here for this young woman, uh, you could see how she has sort of a boxy jaw, which is masculine. Uh, so if you inject that muscle, uh, you could relax it and you can make the, uh, the angle of your mandible less boxy. This is more common in Korean women than in uh, Caucasian, but uh, occasionally you'll have a patient who asks for that. So if those are the classic indications and then the advanced indications, these are the indications that I have mixed feelings about. Not totally bogus, which I'll talk about later, but, question, but indications that uh, or hit or miss. So a nostril flare, I've yet to have a patient ask me for this. Uh, it's difficult because there's more than one muscle on the nose that can cause that. Uh, and also it doesn't seem to be a major complaint for people, but that exists. Um, yes, there are muscles at the base of your septum of your nose that hold down the tip of your nose. So the idea is if you inject those muscles, then the, upper, then the tip of your nose would go up. Uh, it sounds good in theory, but uh, in actuality, what only happens is that when you smile, if the tip goes down, it might not go down as much. So again, yes, that's reasonable, but not a common complaint. Uh, and this last one, there are doctors that would say to you, oh, if you have bands in your neck, which I'll show you in a second, then Botox would help, but it's only for active bands. What do I mean by that? So most patients that complain of these bands, it's because the platysma muscles have relaxed and that's what's giving them kind of a droopy turkey neck appearance. We want the neck to look like that. So for most patients, Botox is contraindicated because the muscles are already too relaxed. So you, you don't want them to, you don't want to make them even more relaxed because they'll sag even more. So for the vast majority of patients, these bands, which are the edges of the platysmal muscle, you want to sew them together like this. And this is part and parcel of a facelift and a neck lift. So then you get a smooth contour and the bands aren't visible. 
So the only patient that would benefit from Botox to the platysma is a patient like this, a younger patient typically that has good skin tone, but she doesn't like what happens when she makes this funny face. So that's why it's, it's not common because if she weren't making this grimace, then she wouldn't see those lines. So yes, this patient got Botox and yes, those lines aren't as bad, but you have to say to yourself, how often do you walk around making this face? So I think the, uh, the better strategy would be maybe just try not to make that face. You could live your whole life, have a full life without ever grimacing like this. So I think the indications for Botox in the neck are pretty limited. So what are the indications that are out there, but in my opinion, are totally bogus. Uh, there's something in the stratosphere called uh, lip flip, which makes no sense because if you inject Botox anywhere in the upper lip, it's gonna relax it. It's not gonna make more of the lip show or make your lips look any poutier or anything like that. So that, so that doesn't make any sense. Yes, you could inject a filler to the lip and make your lips look bigger, of course, and more pouty, but Botox does not have a role for that. Uh, yes, if we put a lot of Botox in your lower eyelids, they could relax and droop and then make your eyes look bigger, but not in a good way. Because if you see the whites of your eyes under your corny, under your, the color part of your eye, that, that's not good. That makes it look abnormal and too droopy. So yes, technically your eyes look bigger, but it's not attractive. So let's talk about some common questions. Um, so a, a patient, sometimes they hear the word botulism and they get upset. And yes, if, if we're being truthful, Botox can cause botulism. Uh, how does it do it? Um, Botox can get into the bloodstream at very, very high doses, which I'll explain in a second, and it paralyzes the muscles that allow us to breathe, and that's how Botox can be deadly. But uh, yes, it can be caused if you use huge amounts of Botox, but you're only doing that when you have medical reasons, like for example, a child that's born with a spastic muscle in their neck, for example, they might require hundreds of units of Botox, but we're using a fraction of that when we do cosmetic, when we do Botox for cosmetic reasons. So down here, this is the important part. There's literally never been a single report of having that complication, death or botulism, when we're doing Botox for cosmetic indications. So the real answer is no, you don't have to worry about botulism. Okay, so if we don't have to worry about botulism, then what are the common side effects? Well, when you inject between the eyebrows, there is a small risk, 3% of getting eyelid ptosis. So why, did, why could that happen? Well, all of the risks basically are if the Botox accidentally drifts too far down and gets into the eyelid or gets too much into the eyebrows. Um, so that's what happens. That's why, as I'll discuss in a minute, why we have some post-procedure recommendations to prevent that from happening. So the good news, I should say to eyelid ptosis, the word ptosis means droopy, and that could apply to the brows, to the eyelids, to the breasts. So that means your eyelids look droopy and they're too low over your, uh, and they could actually uh, impinge upon your, uh, uh, your pupils. Uh, so again, the chance of that happening is very low. And the other good news about eyelid ptosis, if it were to happen to you, there's an eye drop that can reverse it. Uh, crow's feet, not a big uh, problem. Edema, just because you're injecting, your, you know, you're using a needle in the skin. So you, know, you can get a little bit of edema. That hasn't been a complaint in my experience. Strangely, with the forehead, you can get a headache. Uh, I say strangely because Botox is also FDA approved to treat headaches. So it's a little, it's a little opposite of what you might think, but 9% of people can get a headache. And yes, I've heard people complain about that, but it doesn't sound as if it's anything out of the ordinary. Uh, similar to the eyelids, you can get brow ptosis. Eyelid, uh, I'm sorry, eyebrows that are too low. It happens 2% of the time. Unfortunately, if that were to happen, we can try to reverse it with Botox, but that might be irreversible, at least for the three months that Botox is working. So how do, how do we prevent any of these bad things from happening? Well, the four things that we ask you to do postoperatively, they're all for four hours. And like I said, they're all designed that the Botox doesn't accidentally go too low and cause a problem. So those things are don't vigorously rub the injection sites. Don't hang your head over like when you tie your shoes. Don't do anything that's gonna raise your blood pressure like exercise and don't lay perfectly flat. So the, all of these are designed that the boat dust doesn't drift too low. Uh, if you're not sure you can remember all that, uh, we give a cardboard uh, postcard size things with the instructions on it so you don't have to remember them when you leave. Uh, how do we know the right dose? That's a good question. Well, you know, from experience, we know that there's a finite range of the correct dose. 
in general, men need much more of a higher dose than women, but we know of a range that's typically uh, the correct dose. So we start with that. Every patient has their perfect dose. And so if you come in and you have a particularly deep line or the muscles look very strong, we could uh, tailor that to each patient. But the first time that we treat you, it's a little bit of uh, um, an issue where we are making our best guess as to what the, your perfect dose is. So the first time that I treat you, you might choose to come back in two weeks. In two weeks, the Botox has done what it's going to do. So at that point, you could uh, uh, pass judgment. So if you're not totally happy, come back in. And if I think it's appropriate, we can give you a few more units. So if that's the case and that works, then we know from next time what your ideal dose would be. Uh, how do we charge for it? That's a common question. Uh, we charge per unit, which is the only uh, fair way to do it, not by area or by volume. The reason is because, like I said, every patient is different. So for the given area, like for example, for the forehead, uh, some patients might require three units, literally, and some men especially might require 30, literally. So it doesn't make any sense uh, to charge those two types of patients the same amount. So it doesn't make sense to do it by area doesn't make sense to do it by volume because the first thing we do when we give the Botox is we dilute it and you could dilute it with as much or as little saline as you want. So you can't really charge by uh, volume. So uh, unit is the only safe way to do it. Uh, this is going to come up. So I might as well tell you, uh, typically we charge $15 a unit. Why did I say typically? Well, because number one, we frequently run specials and number two, uh, the Botox company Allergan has a points program. So the more Botox you use, the more cash back you get. Uh, the other nice thing is that Allergan also makes the most common fillers we use. So if you get fillers, the points go into the same pot. Uh, a lot of patients have heard of Dysport. Uh, so Dysport is kind of like the Pepsi to Botox's Coke. So they're different brands. Uh, they both work well, uh, but uh, the Botox and Dysport molecules are not exactly the same. So it's possible that if you don't have a great result from Botox, it's possible that you might have a good result from Dysport. Uh, it's important to realize the dosages are not interchangeable. What do I mean by that? So if somebody is advertising Dysport for $5 and something per unit, and you're saying, wow, you know, my other doctor charges $15 per unit, the reason is, is that you need two and a half times the dose of Dysport to match the Botox dose. So you have to multiply that $5, whatever, by 2.5 to get the equivalent price. So having said that, uh, in our practice anyway, Dysport is still a little cheaper because even when you correct for the different dosages, instead of $15 per unit, Dysport is $13 per unit. So it is a little bit cheaper. Um, I typically tell patients to start with Coke, right? Because that's sort of the gold standard. And if you're not happy with it, or if you don't think it's doing what it could do, we could switch you to Dysport. Some people get a better result. Um, so, you know, if that's the case, we can certainly do Dysport from that point on. Common question here, what, what do I have to, uh, do I have to keep doing it once I start? The answer is no, uh, nothing bad will happen if you do it a couple times and then stop. You'll just go back to looking like you did if you never started doing it. There's no downside to doing it and stopping. And I think we spoke about this. How long does it last? Everybody's different. I've heard some patients say six months or longer. Uh, everybody metabolizes the Botox molecule faster or slower, but on average, it lasts about three months. Okay, so that's it for Botox. Um, again, if you have any questions, you know, please type it in the chat box and uh, I'll address it at the end. So moving on to fillers. So first of all, a lot of patients mix up Botox and filler. So Botox is the one that works on muscles. Fillers just fill in lines and add volume and help shape the contours of the face. They don't do anything at all to the muscle. So they're totally different. Um, and if you can think of them as temporary or semi-permanent fillers. So uh, semi-permanent sounds better, right? But uh, there's trade-offs. Uh, typically, they're more expensive. Uh, they might require multiple visits to get the results that you want. Um, they're semi-permanent because they're thicker and they might feel too thick or too hard and that's a complaint for some patients. Uh, similarly, if it's thicker, there's going to be a higher incidence of high, having lumps and bumps, which is a very uncommon uh, complication when you use the temporary fillers. And the biggest risk, I think, when you're using a semi-permanent filler is that they're not reversible. For the temporary fillers, there's an injection that we could inject if you're not happy that'll dissolve it away. 
However, that doesn't exist for the semi-permanent ones, so that always limits their popularity. Uh, so in general, the temporary fillers own about 75 of 77 percent of the injectable filler market. So about the temporary runs, these are the common brands that you probably heard of. Uh, the common brands are all both made from hyaluronic acid. So again, uh, this is sort of the Juvederm is the Coke and Restylane made by another company is sort of the Pepsi. Uh, it's not clear that one is superior to the other. Some doctors and some patients have preferences. I don't have a preference uh, in my practice. Uh, Restylane is a little cheaper just because it, it costs a little bit less for us to buy. Uh, there's no worries about this being a foreign thing um, like Botox because hyaluronic acid is something that's already in our connective tissue in our body. So this is a naturally occurring substance. It's very smooth. Uh, there's no lumps and bumps, which can be a risk with these uh, semi-permanent fillers. And again, the, uh, the temporary fillers are reversible. Um, having said that, to make things more confusing, there are several types of Juvederm and several types of Restylane, some of which are thicker than others, and we'll talk about that later. So what about the semi-permanent fillers? Uh, so how, how do these differ? Well, basically uh, in two ways, they typically have something in them that is meant to last longer than hyaluronic acid, not permanently, but last longer uh, than the hyaluronic acid ones. And the other concept is these companies like to promote them as these being stimulants of collagen new formation. Uh, however, the literature is a little bit, uh, 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 a little, it's a little gray, you know, as to whether that's truly the case or not. So in, in my experience, these fillers really do not last much longer than the temporary fillers. Uh, so you, you may recognize these brands. So calcium hydroxyapatite crystals are like little uh, calcium spheres that are in a gel base. So what happens is the gel uh, dissolves away quickly and the crystals do eventually, but the idea is that it leaves behind some substances that encourage new collagen to grow. Uh, the common, the brand name is called Radius. Um, it is thicker than hyaluronic acid fillers and that could be a blessing or a curse. Uh, it's good, uh, the good part about it being thicker is that it can mimic bone. So if you're trying to do something to the face where you want to simulate that you're adding bone, and we could talk about that later, then that's the filler of choice. But if you want to put it somewhere where you want it to be soft, like for example, if you got the wrong idea to put it in the lips, that's a very bad idea because it might last long, but it's gonna be hard. Uh, so um, it, it has pros and cons of being thicker. Uh, Bellafil is a relatively new brand. Uh, those are polymethyl methacrylate spheres, which is the same stuff that's used in orthopedic cement, believe it or not, but these are tiny little bits of it that are in a collagen base. So again, the collagen goes away quickly. The spheres hang around, eventually they dissolve, but the idea is that new collagen would be stimulated. Uh, I have to say, a lot of patients hear this. They hear five-year filler. I, I, I do not believe it lasts that long. Uh, the people that make Bellafil, they did a study, uh, and they said, oh, looks, it lasts as, as long as five years. But if you read the study carefully, you realize that those patients got touch-ups periodically. And the, the study was very nebulous about how often the touch-ups were and how much more Bellafil they got. So unfortunately, it would be misleading for me to tell you it lasts much more than a year. Uh, the one indication in my mind for Bellafil is for acne scars. Now, why is that the case? Because acne scars, typically, if you're trying to fix those, you're injecting very superficially. Now, hyaluronic acid fillers are tough to put that superficial because sometimes you could see them it's what's called the Tyndall effect. If you put it very superficially, you see sort of like a silvery sheen for, uh, of the filler. So that's a bad thing. And that limits how superficially you could inject a hyaluronic acid filler. But Bellafil doesn't have that problem. So I think if there's any indication for this stuff, it's good for acne scars. Uh, Sculpture has been around for a while. Uh, poly L lactic acid is actually the same stuff that's in absorbable sutures. Uh, sculpture never really caught on because it's a little more expensive and also you have to do several injections over several months to get the results that you want and that's a turn off for patients that they have to keep coming back. But having said that, I think it has a role in adding large amounts of volume to the mid cheeks. Uh, what I mean by that is I like to tell patients when you're injecting filler, you'll get a better result if you're injecting on top of a backboard, meaning if there's something hard like bone underneath you, so the volume goes out rather than sinking in. But if you do it right to the mid cheek, under the cheekbone, it's just gonna sink in. So you could dump loads and loads of hyaluronic acid filler and you won't look any different. 
Uh, so I think this is the role for Sculptra, where if you need a lot of volume like that, then Sculptra plays a role. Also, fat grafting plays a role. Um, so uh, fat grafting is nice because fat is permanent and it's soft and it's obviously from your own body, but not everybody wants to hop, have an operation. Uh, the way we get fat is by liposuction. So it's kind of a kill two birds with one stone scenario, but not everybody wants to go to the operating room. So they may or may not be a candidate for fat grafting and sculpture could be an alternative. So what do the fillers do? So like I said, you can think of it as just trying to fill in a line, like especially the smoker lines, that's a great example on the upper lip blend contours together, I'll talk to you about that, or just simply add volume. Now, why is that important? Uh, because as we get older and or as we lose weight, you lose weight and fullness to your face and some of that might be desirable. You know, it's nice when you lose fat that you don't want over your body, but sometimes if you lose the volume to your face, that can make you look older. So we can restore that volume to any part of your face uh, with the injectable fillers. Uh, so again, here we are in that algorithm. We made our way. Uh, we're not having surgery. We're not having Botox. And yes, we decided the line is deep enough for filler, so we're going to inject the filler. Uh, so here's a diagram. I just wanted to show you how literally there's no part of the face that we can't inject a filler in appropriate doses and in appropriate places for either trying to make something look better or to replace volume that's been lost either by age or, or from weight loss. So where are the common places to do it? The common place are the smoker lines, like we mentioned, under the eyes, which is called a tear trough. That is a great place to put it. Uh, it makes a huge difference and it could last as long as a year, uh, which is not the case for some other lo locations that we'll discuss. Uh, the nasolabial folds, which is the line from the corner of your nostrils down to the corner of your mouth. The lines from the corner of your mouth down to your chin are called marionette lines. Uh, to add volume to the cheekbones or to the mid cheeks themselves, and lip augmentation is a great place to put a filler. Uh, so this patient has smoker lines up here. They're not the deepest lines in the world, but uh, they're amenable to a thin, relatively thin filler. And you can see they're not gone, but they're less obvious. Uh, this is a great slide for a couple reasons. Uh, this arrow is to remind myself to talk to you about facial aging. So how you could picture it is that this part of our faces, the central part of your face, even as you get older, sort of stays in the same place. But what happens is the stuff out here starts to descend. So what happens is, is that you start to get step offs, meaning the step off between what's your eyelid and what's your cheek, from what's your eyelid to your upper lip, from what's your jowl to your chin. So these step offs are what we could smooth out with a filler. So here in the post-procedure um, picture, you can see how this is the tear trough that's filled in. So that blends the transition from what's your eyelid to your cheekbone. The nasolabial fold is nicely corrected and as is the marionette line down here. Uh, this is from uh, Allergan's um, website. So this patient had filler to the nasolabial folds. So you can see they're nicely blended there. This patient had the same. You could see that the nasolabial folds are less obvious. Uh, this is the pre-procedure, the post-procedure. And also this woman had a subtle lip augmentation. You could see how her lips look a little fuller in the post-procedure picture. Uh, this patient had injection right on the cheekbone. So the idea here is to give you more volume to the cheekbone and makes it more appley, I like to say, and gives you a more youthful look. Uh, for a patient like this, I would use a relatively thick filler. Uh, something like Voluma or Radius, the thicker one, uh, because we're putting it deep. We're putting it right on the cheekbone, so you don't have to worry about how thick and hard the filler is because we're putting it right on the bone, so we want it to mimic bone, so it's okay that it's a little bit firmer. Uh, these are patients of my own. These patients got lip augmentation. Uh, so most patients get one syringe total, meaning a half a syringe of filler to the upper and lower lips. Uh, everybody's different. Some people want more than that, but that's probably typical. Uh, so this is the typical result that you can expect. What's nice about lip augmentation, it's highly customizable. Uh, this patient had it in the bulk of her lip because she wanted to keep the same shape, just make them bigger. So you can do it there. You can put it in the edge of the lip here, which is called the Cupid's bow, if you want to accentuate that, which is a nice uh, look. Uh, you can accentuate these things up here called the filtral columns. These are all uh, nice things to make your lips look more sensuous, uh, that could all be done with the same kind of filler. Uh, this patient had one and a half syringes to her upper and lower lips total. Uh, this patient had one syringe. 
Uh, so if those were sort of the basic indications, are some advanced places for filler. Uh, the things we'll talk about are the upper eyelid hollows, uh, injecting volume to the nose if there's some shape that you don't like about it, and things we could do to the jawline. So uh, upper lid hollows, uh, it's not attractive to be able to see the edge of your bony socket like that. Uh, and this happens with age or with weight loss. So obviously this woman is much younger in this picture, but you can see how full her eyelid is. So in general, this is a nice uh, way to introduce the concept of being conservative. When, sur when plastic surgeons started doing facelifts and eyelids, I think they were too aggressive. And they went in there and they excised a lot of skin, a lot of fat. And yeah, they, they, they removed everything up there, but they didn't help the patient. Uh, in some ways, they made them look worse and older. So now we have a, a, a better appreciation for the healthy volume and the healthy fullness on a patient. Uh, so we're much more careful not to overdo it. So if this patient came into the office, uh, we could do a filler right under the bone there, and that'll sort of blend the, uh, the, the highly visible edge of the socket there. Again, a nice place to put it. Um, I should tell you, we'll get to this later, but uh, if you put the filler in somewhere that doesn't move very much, and this is true for both down here, the lower part of the socket and up here, it hardly moves at all. So it doesn't get absorbed very quickly. So when you put the filler there, it could last as long as a year. So here's an example of uh, doing a bad eyelid job. So this patient is 45, and this is what she looked like after her eyelid surgery. So this woman was aged by this procedure. So this is what you don't want to do. You don't want to take out all this volume and all this fat because uh, it actually deepens the sulcus, the hollows, and makes you look older. So this surgeon didn't do this patient any favor. She looked younger here with this pleasant fullness. So here's a patient who just had filler. So again, here's the, uh, you can see the bony socket and you can see how deep that is. So typically we could use half a syringe of filler on either side and that gets rid of that deep crease. Another example, same thing. So upper eyelids kind of hollowed out. It's very easy to see the edge of her bony socket. Same thing, you can see how this is much less, uh, uh, much more full and uh, the crease is much less obvious. Here's the same patient in a three-quarter view. So you see the, the deepness there and how it looks so much better there just from filler. So what about a non-surgical no job? So that, yes, it exists, but to be honest, there aren't many patients that are good candidates for it because the vast majority of patients, when they come in and they want a nose job, they, they want volume taken away. Their nose is too big and they want stuff taken away, not stuff added. But for example, if this patient uh, doesn't like the, the, uh, the dorsum of her nose and the profile and doesn't like this part here, which is called a super tip break. You could put some filler in there and make the uh, dorsum of her nose straighter and less of an indent right there. It's also good if a patient did have a rhinoplasty or if they had some other kind of trauma to their nose and they have a depression or asymmetry, uh, they might be a candidate for a non-surgical nose job. And again, this is a great place to use radius because that's the thick one. That's the one that can mimic bone uh, but we want it to mimic bone or cartilage in this situation, so we're not worried about it being too thick or too hard. Uh, I, show, I chose these slides because I wanted to show you the mandible or the jawline. So here in the pre-procedure photograph, this is the jowl. So again, her cheek and jowl are descending. The chin is staying in place, so you get a step off between the jowl and the chin. And also the edge of the mandible, where we want that to be nice and smooth, you can see it's broken up by the jowl that's hanging over the jawline. So she'd be a great candidate for a facelift. This is a, a major thing that a facelift does, but if she doesn't want surgery, you could sort of camouflage the jowl by putting a filler in front of it and behind it to sort of camouflage it, there it is, so it doesn't look as obvious. So again, this is a great place to use the radius because we want it to mimic the bone of your jawline. So it's okay if it's thick because we want it to mimic bone. So here's a similar patient. Uh, so here it is, the, the jowl is descended. It's breaking up the nice even jawline and you could see with filler in front of it and behind it, you could attain a much smoother line. Uh, this patient wanted his jawline to be more obvious here and more masculine, so again, uh, this is called the angle of the mandible, where it sort of becomes an L, kind of the corner of the jawbone. So if we put a filler here, again, it's nice to use radius. You can make this more obvious, and it can, uh, 
look, make the look, made the, make the jaw look square or more obvious and make the transition between what's the cheek and what's the neck more obvious. So that's a popular place to put it, usually for men. So this is a patient of mine who had a chin implant, but the reason why I wanted to show this is because let's say she didn't like her chin and she wanted to be bigger, but she didn't want to commit to a chin implant, which is what she got. If you put the filler on the chin, it might take a, a several syringes, but doing this makes sort of like a dry run for a facial implant. So if patients that want to try to see what they look like with a chin implant, but they don't want to commit themselves to surgery, uh, it can be done with uh, radius filler. Okay, so how about the risks of fillers? Well, these are common things and these are associated, these first three can be associated even with high hyaluronic acid, even with the soft temporary ones. But obviously they're very minor, bruising, redness, firmness. None of these uh, are a major problem. If you get bruising, honestly, it's usually nothing terrible. Uh, usually something that could be covered with makeup and will be gone within the week. Uh, redness can happen just sort of from irritation that's typically gone in about 48 hours. Same thing with firmness, and that can be a complaint when you use the thicker semi-permanent fillers, because again, the trade-off that you have, if they're gonna be thicker and last longer, they might uh, feel harder as well, so that's a trade-off. And again, lumps and bumps, in my experience, those have only been issues with semi-permanent fillers and not the hyaluronic acid ones. Uh, there are some cosmetic risks. You know, We try to do exactly what the patient wants, but what if you're not happy? Maybe you think it's uneven, maybe you think it's too big or too small. Uh, the good, the nice thing about the high hyaluronic acid fillers is they remain malleable for at least two weeks. That means that we could have you come back and massage out the filler if you don't think it's smooth. We can give you more. And the ultimate safety factor is if you hate it and you don't want to wait it out, there is an enzyme that we can inject that'll totally dissolve the filler away. So if you didn't like it, uh, you don't have to live with it. It can be dissolved away. And again, that's not the case with the semi-permanent fillers. Uh, yes, it does hurt a little bit more than Botox because the consistency of Botox is like water, but the consistency of the fillers is like at least hair gel. The thicker ones, the consistency is more like toothpaste. So uh, you're injecting something thicker. Yes, it's going to hurt more, but we call out all the stops so it doesn't hurt as much. We use a prescription strength topical cream before we do the injection, uh, and there's lidocaine mixed into the filler. Uh, so we go through, we take steps so that it, it's as comfortable as possible. How long does it last? That's a very loaded question because it depends on number one, what kind of filler it is, how thick is it, and number two, where you dissolve it. Uh, so obviously the thicker fillers will last longer, but in terms of the injection sites, the way you can think about it is the closer we get to the mouth, the less the filler will last because it dissolves away quicker because it moves around so much. So that's why if you do it around the eyes, Juvederm Velour, which is sort of the workhorse in our practice, could last as long as a year. But if you put that same stuff in the marionette lines or the nasolabial folds, it only lasts six or seven months. The same stuff in the lips themselves is only three months. So you could, you could see how it's very variable as term, in terms of even though you're using the same product, how long it lasts is highly variable depending on how close to the mouth you get. Uh, so on the cheekbones themselves, Voluma is the thicker version of Juvederm. I don't know why they named both with a V, it's confusing, but this is the thicker kind. Also high hyaluronic acid, just thicker. It could last as long as a year in that location. It would also be appropriate to, to use Radius in this location because that's the one that mimics bone. In my experience, Voluma and Radius both last about one year. So the nasolabial folds and the marionette lines, uh, we could do either Velour or Voluma because we place the filler deep enough that the, the thickness of the Voluma is not an issue. So what I typically tell patients is if you choose the Voluma over the Velour, it is a little more expensive, but you can get a few months more out of the effect, uh, six or seven months versus nine or 10 months. Uh, so this is a great thing that we've added to our practice. We've had it for many years. Uh, it's called Chrysalix. It uses virtual reality and morphing software. So we could show, we could demonstrate to you what you can look like by getting injections of Botox or fillers before you actually do it. So if you're on the fence, this can help make up your mind. So I'm gonna share a new screen with you and I'll show you what uh, the software could do. So some of you that know our practice will recognize Nikki. She works at the front desk. So she was kind enough to let us use her photos. Now, Nikki doesn't have a lot of lines, but I could show you a couple things. So uh, Allergan is the company that makes Botox and Juvederm. Uh, so let's choose Botox. So if I had to choose anywhere, 
I'd say she has some mild glabellar lines if you use your imagination there. So again, uh, they uploaded the three common uh, classic places to put Botox. I don't think she doesn't have a single line on her forehead or her crow's feet, but we can choose the glabellar lines and we could blur that out with this tool. So you can see how those little depressions go away. Uh, so this can simulate what the, the kind of effect you can get with Botox. Uh, so let's go back. Um, so what about filler? So here we go. Let's choose Juvederm now. And again, she doesn't have many lines or depressions, but right here, I think, is the most obvious thing. This is the tear trough. So let's choose under the eyes here, and you could watch that. That'll blend, blend, blend uh, when we use the slide bar. So that can give you an idea of what you would look like if we were to put a filler under the eyes. And finally, how about lip augmentation? So we could get out of this and use uh, uh, the lip uh, uh, toolbox here. And so this will show us with the lower lip, we could slide that to make that smaller or bigger. Let's make it a little bigger like that. And the upper one, let's make it a little bit bigger like that. And maybe let's change the crow's, the uh, Cupid's bow a little bit so it's not so pointy. Okay, let's save that. Okay, so what we can do is we could save this with all the things we just changed. And we could say after, afterwards, let's say that. And we could save it. So what we can do, load, and it could show us the before and after side by side. Uh, and you could look at it in different angles. You could rotate it back and forth. You could use some pre-chosen angles. So it's very nice. And this works for both the face and body. So this is really a great tool that we have. Okay, so let's go back. Okay. So I call the end of the talk, putting it all together. And this is uh, just a few photos of some well-known celebrities. I just wanted to show you what I think maybe they have had done, but this is just a disclaimer. I haven't treated them. I don't know if they had anything done, but this can show you how we could integrate all of these things, skin resurfacing, surgery, Botox and fillers uh, to get the results that we want. So this, this is a great picture. I don't know if this is Photoshopped or not, but this is uh, Kate Middleton. She's the Duchess of Cambridge. She's Prince William's wife. So I pointed out some hours here so you can see she's got some fine forehead lines. I'm trying to point out here that her eyebrow is a little low and flat. These are the crow's feet. And you hear the lines that for her lower lid like we talked about here, the bunny lines. This is a marionette line that's fairly deep and her teeth look a little dingy. So you could see, um, I don't know if she did anything, but you could see how the forehead lines are gone. You can see how her eyebrow is more arched and less flat. You could see how you could see more of her eyelid as opposed to that. You can see the crow's feet are gone, the lines under her eyelids are gone, the bunny lines are gone, and this line is less obvious and looks like she widened her teeth. So this is, I don't know if she did anything, but th these can show you what results you can get uh, using non-invasive uh, methods. Uh, Michelle Obama, the reason why I chose this, this is from 2008, this is from 2016. Uh, look at the shape of her brows. Uh, one thing I didn't mention before is the corrugator muscles here that are responsible for the 11s, they also hold down the medial eyebrows. So if you inject the corrugators, the brows can lift and separate. So you can see how her brow shape has a much more pleasant, kind of a less, less of an angry appearance. Uh, and again, I don't know if she had Botox, but this is something you can attain uh, using Botox. Okay, I'm gonna pick on Susan Sarandon a little bit. Uh, again, I don't know if she had anything, but uh, this is a picture where she has forehead lines. Her eyebrows look a little low and flat. She's lost facial volume under her eyes. Uh, again, the tear trough deformity to her mid cheek down here. She's got a jowl and she has neck bands. So what I would do for her if she were my patient, we could do Botox to the forehead and the glabella. We could either do a surgical brow lift or Botox to raise her eyebrows. We could do volume, either uh, uh, injectables or fat grafting to get volume back here and here. And she would benefit for a facelift or, or injectables along the mandible to get rid of the jowl and help with the lines. So the, in this photo, she's actually two years older than she is here. So I don't know if she had anything done, but uh, she definitely looks a lot better. Uh, so that's it. I just want to thank everybody for joining us. I hope you learned something. Uh, we are going to do weekly webinars for the uh, foreseeable future. And the next one, we're going to do breast implants. 
Uh, so uh, again, we're going to post this webinar to our website. So if you want to double check anything we talked about, please do that. Uh, if you have questions for us, I'll answer them now. But if you think of any later, please call us. Uh, we are doing virtual consultations. We have a way of doing a one-on-one face-to-face -on -one -face consultation that's HIPAA compliant and secure. So if you want to do that, uh, you know, please either call us or email Michelle and we could arrange that. So can I? Okay, so let's see if we have any questions. Can Botox temporarily correct hooded eyelids? Yes. So there, it, it let, well, let me, let me preface that. If the eyelids are low and hooded because the brows are low, then yes. So uh, you, if you can raise the brow either with Botox or with a brow lift, a surgical brow lift, then that'll sort of take up the upper eyelid skin and could elevate the eyelids. If your brows are in the correct position and you still have hooding, then the only thing you could do for that is surgery. Uh, so surgery to, on the lids is wonderful because it's low on the scale of pain and downtime and risk, but it's high on the scale of making a difference. Uh, allergic reaction to Botox. So I looked up the uh, insert that comes along with Botox because Botox is considered a, medic a medication, a prescription medication, and they do list it, but it's not even 1% because they didn't add, they didn't assign it a number. So I could tell you I've never seen it, um, but it has been described, but it must be so infrequent that they can't even give it a 1% risk. Okay, here's another question. Can you have lip fillers if you've had an allergic reaction to morphine? A uh, friend was turned away from another practice. Uh, yeah, I don't understand why not, because the filler has high hyaluronic acid in it and it has lidocaine in it. So I understand if you're allergic to lidocaine, but there's no morphine in it. So I don't see why that would be an issue. Okay, so um, I think we're set. So again, thanks everybody. Uh, look for the webinar on our website if you wanna revisit this and uh, um, keep an eye out for the next webinar on breast augmentation. Okay, thanks everybody.